which gets us to slurs. And the purpose of the slur, the most common slur pattern in all of the Baroque, not the first book, but all of the Baroque was slur to, slur to. And that's because, as you heard in some of these movements that John and I play, it really helped to accentuate the unevenness, right? Da, 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 da. Okay? It, they called it mure from the French. Everybody, when you leave today, before you leave, promise me that on your Baroque music, doesn't matter if they're French, German, or German, you're going to stop doing slur to tongue to. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so slur to tongue to is a classical thing. That's um, Mozart. And it's a, his own concerto. It's a great example. He puts it all in there. Mozart. Uh, Haydn, yeah, uh, but they didn't do it in the Baroque. They, they, at some point, they get there, you know, so maybe when we go to play our Stamets or a CPE Bach or a Quantz, who are those in-between guys, in-between the Baroque and the classical. Uh, a lot of, uh, and, and by the way, those, those guys, Quantz and um, especially CPE Bach, they really put a lot of their own information in, so you don't end up adding a lot of slurs to, to say CPE Bach, so. So by the time you get to around then, I mean, 1750 is supposed to be our cutoff between we're in the Baroque, oh, now we're in the, we're headed to the classical, but <coughs> Baroque, slur two, slur two. The next, and that's like 80%, that was the, by far the most popular slur pattern. Are you going to see it in your music? No. You're going to, if you get really good additions, those additions that I wrote at the end of my little notes, um, also promise me that you're, if you can afford it, you're not going to buy your international. <laughs> I know it's hard because it's cheap. Market, but if you can afford a good edition, a lot of our music, be it French, German, or Italian, is not going to have any slurs in it. You're going to put your own in. So start first with slur two, slur two. But you'll see some patterns in, in the melodic line that lend itself well to slur three, tongue one, right? Or tongue one, slur three. Great example of that is the first movement of box E minor. It does a lot of slur three, tongue one, and tongue one, slur three. So in, in all nationalities, a lot of the comments I'm saying today, it's, yeah, for French Baroque, but a lot of comments are really for all of the world. Okay, slur two, slur two, or three plus one, one plus three. No more slur two, tongue two. What about in six, eight? Uh, slur two, tongue one was by far the most common. And again, just depending on the, the, the shape of the note, with the shape of the three note pattern, you might see a leap where you want to do tongue one, slur two. Da 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 da. Okay, so if you see that, it's okay. Yeah. Um, longer slurs, six note slurs were just not done. So I see some additions like that for our, our students where there's a, in a six eight G uh, where all six notes are all slurred together. If we, if we can get our kids to, there's a, technically if it's not an issue for them. <coughs> Slur two, uh, slur two, tongue one, tongue one, slur two. Uh, sometimes, uh, occasionally, three and three. That was done in French, in, in French Baroque, in all Baroque. It's not as common as two plus one or one plus two. Does that make sense? Long slurs, so you can kind of see the pattern here. Long slurs are just not really done a lot in Baroque. Um, and as just a guidance as to how, how many slurs do I add? Well, I mean, we know we, they did tongue note because we, here we talked for like 10 minutes about art, uneven articulation, right? Or, oh, we didn't hear now. So, um, so it does, it's not like you add slurs to all of your moving notes that don't have slurs in them. Um, probably this, this sheet, that this piece that you have, kind of gives you a good idea. You can see how in Bois-Montier's, this particular suite that we did, there were some that were left unslurred. And you can see he gave us a lot of information. Huh? He gave a lot of, that's why I like to use this piece as a start. Use that as your, as your benchmark for how many slurs to add on that. You're not going to, if you see a passage, for example, well, I'll keep thinking of Bach, but you know, it applies to, to Bach and Italian work as well. Like the, the second movement of the C major flute sonata, that so many great players like to perform as a virtuosic double tonguing exercise. Mm -hmm. they, that many notes all in the row would not have been all articulated. We would have definitely been adding slurs there. So just kind of a rule of thumb. Which brings us to articulation. This is 
a this is a hard one as a as a mod, uh, someone who performs on a modern flute. And that is a modern flute. I just chew wood over metal. So, um, but we're taught to. You know, how many hours we go and practice and practice that Mendelssohn scherzo, getting it all nice and even, even every note all sounding the same. And yet, then when we go and pick up our Baroque music, we're supposed to try to imitate the to 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 pattern. So I give you that information to 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 take with it and do what you can. Um, this is just a way of saying the composers did not want your running articulated notes to all be sound equal. And they used not just two, but ru or uh, once writes diri. Mm -hmm. Now that's kind of interesting how, um, let's see, <clears throat> there's an example, you can see where the two, the, the ru syllable is the one that's on the strong note. Okay. Ru is on your first note. So let's say you have four sixteenth notes. Yes. Uh, forgive me. Yeah. Would it not be two 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 two? That you never Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to just give you the basic idea that that ru is, for the most part, on the strong note. Tu is, for the most part, on the weak note. But she's right. When they'll start a passage, they'll start a passage with, oftentimes, with the two. So just trying to give you an idea. <coughs> of, of, we, don't have, we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> I thought that was going to get me in trouble. We don't have a lot. We can't go too much into detail and articulation. But, it, but just the basic starting point is the strong note is actually the ru syllable was used for the strong notes, the two syllable was used for the weak notes, and yet they didn't necessarily start the passage ru to ru to ru. They would start it with the two. Yeah. Oh, too much information. <laughs> so, so the vertical stroke, there's a little there's a little snippet there blocked by Blave. You see that little carrot thing? That is a staccato and that's that was how they wrote staccato at the beginning of the book. And it did gradually morph into the staccato. <coughs> Thus, in a lot of composers, not just French, but all Baroque composers, you'll see both written in. You'll see both uh, dots and slash and that little vertical stroke. So again, you just want to first make sure, is that dot trying to tell me something about playing the notes equal versus unequal? You know? Um, is it early Baroque? If it's an early Baroque piece, maybe that dot is trying to tell you something about playing the notes equally. Okay? But by the end of the Baroque, they're using both the vertical slash and the dots. And then, of course, by the time we get to the classical era, the dot has replaced the, the vertical slash as the staccato. Kind of confusing. But just question the dot if it's in the first half of the Baroque era. That's my take away. Okay? Um, uh, you'll see that vertical stroke or dots combined with a slur over it. Some composers will give you that much information. That means that we're imitating on the string. Okay, the notes are just more connected. Again, in, envision what what that what that means, what that would sound like if the bow didn't leave the string, it stayed on the string. Double tonguing. The French just did not do it before 1750. They did not do double tonguing. The first person who writes about it is Quance in 1752. Well, that's that's pretty much the end of the Baroque. German and Italian, yes. Double tonguing in the Baroque. French Baroque, they did not do double tonguing. Yeah. It was much more popular in Germany than in France. You might Towards the end of the Baroque, you might see, it's very rare, but you might see a really long uh, chevron sign. I have it written here. You might look at that and think, oh, am I supposed to trill on every note here? No, that was, that was uh, some French uh, composers towards the end of the Baroque were trying to use that as a way of saying double time here. Yeah. 
So if you see that, don't let that confuse you. Yeah, it looks like that's my that was my little W on my Microsoft Word program. <laughs> but you know what I mean by that chevron? You've seen that little the uh, this one here. Uh, so in our Baroque music, we have the TR sign, but we also have what we call the chevron. That's where chevron gets the oil company gets its name. This this symbol existed in Western civilization before chevron oil company. Yeah. Um, we've seen that a lot in music. That's a chevron. Composers use that for trill signs. So my point is that you'll see sometimes in late French Baroque, you'll see that over a series of fast moving notes, a really long version of it, you'll think, am I supposed to be trilling? Now it's, it's, they started trying to find a way to tell performers to double tone. So it's, that's just a little, watch out for that. Um, questions before I try to give you some insight on ornamentation. So all that is clear as mm -hmm. <laughs> Um Ornamentation. So the bâtiment from the Morgan. It doesn't get much more French than the Morgan. Um, it's the one ornament that you can start a movement with, start a, a section with, uh, a phrase. So you heard me and you saw it's written in when I would go back and repeat a phrase. That's you know, this one little way that I would vary. So you can do that right on the very first note, the morning. You don't really want to do that with other ornaments on that first note of the piece, but you can do that on the It's a lot of times in music the symbol looks like an uppercase I. A lot of times in music, the, the symbol looks like that chevron sign with that slash in it, okay? Mm -hmm. So when you see that chevron sign with the slash, it's not a trill, the movement, that slash makes it more sense. Um, let's see. So it's just like a trill, but it goes to the lower note. Does that all make sense? Do you all know about more? Mm -hmm. um, these one note grace notes, one note grace notes. So you saw that, that, that little V sign, that's uh, a grace note from below. The porte de bois. So the porte de bois will often be notated with a V over the note, um, but it'll sometimes be notated with just the little note itself. It's before the beat. It's not on the beat. Okay? It's a very important distinction. French one note grace notes were before the beat. Very different from German and Italian. German and Italian grace notes generally on the beat. Porte de Bois is most definitely placed before the beat. Um, where is a good example? I know you heard it, but. Um, um, should I use the metronome? Not that fast. <laughs> <laughs> Major four in the Alamont. Let's kind of go slow. So you can hear. This is your half note. I'm beating half note. So major four in the Alamont. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A portrait wall is an imposter 
contour from below. It comes before the beat. It is not placed on the beat. Most of the time, it's not played that plainly. Okay? Most of the time, it's played like this. Here's major four and five of all one. Okay? When you see the B, the composer generally wants you to do not just the little tiny note, but also. The porte de voix, a piece, the little note from below, plus a mordant right on the beat. Okay? Does that make sense? Here's major four and five again. Even though there's just a B, most of the time the composer really did want you to do not just the little note, but as many mordant wiggles as you want once you hit your main note. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You don't have to. It just depends. There were many times on some of these movements um, where I wanted to just do the little note. Go to the 6-8, the gay mole, Emeryville, Lever Fifty. That six, that little short six eight movement. Look at the double ball. Okay. Now this is our dotted quarter. So on these, and look here. Look at that double bar. Why does he choose there to write out a little tiny B instead of a V? See what I'm saying? In the middle of the six eight, right at the double bar. Why not a V there? I don't know. So, uh, in that passage there, a lot of times it felt really difficult to do a lot of mordants when there was a little B. So right there, I just played just the little lower neighbor. Whenever there was a note with a B over it, a little lower neighbor. But a lot of times, you'll see the composer actually write out the little lower note. Right here at the double bar, you gave us a little B. Bach does that. Where does he do that? Our French suite. Mm -hmm. So next time you play, go play that French suite. Those little uh, appoggiatures from below, those are all port de voix. They're not supposed to be on the beat. Okay, try it. <laughs> next time. And it'll feel funny. And then like, oh my god, no. But it'll feel like you're wearing your shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> try it. They're supposed to be before the beat, though. Not on the beat. Port de voix and coulées, the 
They are not on the beat. The cuve is a little tiny note put inserted in between a descending third. If you look at my music, you can see places where I penciled in my own. I wanted to add to a section the second time around. Okay? For example, I ended the plot. Major 22, I think I wrote the notes for Major 22. So that was very common to do. And you saw a third, leap of a third. It's a great tool to do on your repeat, right? We want to vary a little bit on repeat. On your repeat, all of your descending thirds, stick a little poulet in between, okay? The accent. Juan Mortier writes them in himself. Where's that at? In our box. Major 12 is a lot. See the accent? Those little tiny notes? Here's our quarter note. Here's our quarter. Major 12 is a lot. So. Okay, what you're hearing now ticking, I'm ticking eighth notes 
the beginning of that 6 8 gain mark, that movement number four, right after the three. So the six eight. See that trill sign on the G? And again, and by the way, T, T, R, plus sign, chevron, there, don't read too much into which one it is the composer's writing there. Some composers do try to say TR for a longer trill and that little chevron squiggle for a shorter trill, but not always. Beginning of the sixth day on that D. It's a trick. 
thrilled E. <coughs> but I spent most of that E time playing an F, huh? That's what they wanted there. They and, wanted a, and a beautifully shaped appoggiatura it was. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's meant, and it really, it adds this nice harmonic crunch. Maybe right there in that passage, I bet if we looked at the piano score, I, I can tell you it does. The, the harmony is static there. So the orchestra has you holding that F sound. It really clashes with whatever the harmony there, the E. And then when you do finally resolve, so you do it whenever you see that symbol, but you can also do it whenever you feel like it. Whenever you see, <laughs> whenever you see the plus sign of the TR, when, you put, when is a good time to do a trill like that with your upper note start so long that you, you barely do a couple of one or two note on conclusions? How about when your underlying harmony is totally static? Okay, so it's a little long note, but being trilled and the underlying harmony is really static, that's where you can do it. I think we're getting kicked out. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>